In this video, we're going to talk about the different atomic level mechanisms by which creep deformation occurs. So when I say creep mechanisms, what I really mean is at the atomic level, how is the deformation occurring? So is this, for example, primarily through dislocation motion? Or is it primarily through diffusion? And if it is through diffusion, is that diffusion happening primarily along the grain boundaries? Or is that occurring primarily through the bulk? So these are some of the different ways in which the plastic deformation that we see macroscopically as a result of creep may be occurring at the atomic level. So let's look through each of these mechanisms and let's find an equation for the strain rate for each of them. So in the previous video we saw sort of generally that the steady state creep rate was given by this kind of equation and in this video we will find the specific equation for each of the different mechanisms. The first mechanism that we're going to look at is dislocation creep or power law creep. In this case, the plastic deformation occurs through the motion of dislocations. As we have seen previously, those dislocations need some critical resolved shear stress in order to glide through the lattice. We'd also seen though that obstacles can impede that dislocation motion, increasing the stress that's needed. In the case of creep deformation though, because we're operating at high temperature, obstacles can be overcome more easily by dislocation climb, which essentially just enables that dislocation motion to occur uh, more rapidly. And because it's this dislocation climb that's allowing the dislocations to keep moving, and because climb happens through vacancy motion, the strain rate is determined by that vacancy motion. So the mobility of the vacancies is essentially what's determining the power law creep behavior. So let's take a look then at the equation for strain rate in dislocation creep. So here's the equation and let's look through this. So this has the subscript PLC for power law creep. A is still some constant. R and T as before the gas constant and temperature. Sort of interesting or important thing here is that we have sigma to the N and for power law creep N is typically between uh, 3 and 8. Then we have D naught, which is sort of a, the diffusion uh, constant. And E, we have two different activation energies showing up here, and that's because we have sort of two different steps in this process. The first is for vacancy formation, because we have to create a vacancy in the lattice first, and the second is for vacancy migration. So the vacancy has to form, and then it has to move over to the dislocation in order to enable it to climb. So these vacancy formation and migration activation energies are, are known, usually, from experiment. And so the sort of signs that you have power law creep are if you plot strain rate versus stress and you get an n value in this range, that's one of them. And then also if you plot strain rate versus temperature and you're seeing an activation energy that matches that of vacancy formation and migration, that's another sign that that's the creep mechanism that's in play. Okay, let's move on now and look at diffusional creep. So dislocation creep or power law creep usually happens at uh, higher stresses and or lower temperatures because you need that stress to get the dislocations moving, uh, although you also need the temperature to allow dislocation climb to happen. 
However, if the temperature is, is very high and the stress is not too high, then other mechanisms are possible. In fact, without dislocations moving, vacancy diffusion alone can cause plastic deformation. In this case, the grain boundaries act as sources and sinks for vacancies. So they both sort of eat up and spit out the vacancies. So how does this work? So let's imagine that we have this one grain here and we are applying a stress essentially in, in this direction. And so uh, the grain boundaries that are there will feel that kind of stress, but the grain boundaries that, will, that are here will sort of feel the opposite kind of stress. And so these grain boundaries that are perpendicular to the stress like this will be in tension, and that will essentially create vacancies. Because a grain boundary is really just the sort of misaligned region between the two grains. And so if there's a tensile stress there, that's almost sort of creating more room, which can turn into a vacancy, essentially. In contrast, these grain boundaries here that, that run parallel to the applied stress, they're in compression, and so they absorb vacancies. So there's already some atomic mismatch there, but now it's getting pushed together, essentially, because of that applied stress. And so they, those grain boundaries would, would be glad to actually have some vacancies. So we can then look at the direction of vacancy flux. So the vacancies are generated here and moved down here. The other way to think about this is in terms of the atomic flux. The atomic flux would just be going in the other direction. So if we reversed those purple arrows, that would be the direction in which the atoms are moving. And you would see then that's how the specimen would get elongated. So let's look then at the equation for this. Okay, so here's our equation. Uh, we have the strain rate, and this has the subscript NH, that's for Nabarro herring. And that's just what this mechanism is typically called, although sometimes it's called the volume, uh, volume diffusion creep. And in a minute, we'll look at a different kind called cobalt creep. The way I remember the difference, actually, is that Nabarro herring has more letters, and there's a lot more volume than there is grain boundary. So then we have uh, next some constant. We have the applied stress. Notice that there is no exponent on it, which is really just telling us that our stress exponent is equal to 1. We have this uh, omega here. That's the atomic volume. R and T take their normal uh, meanings. And over here we have dV. This is the volume diffusivity. So really, the activation energy is hiding in here because this takes on some form which looks like this, right? But it's for diffusion through the volume or through the bulk. Because while the vacancies or atoms are moving from one grain boundary to another, they're doing it by moving through the grain. Okay, so the diffusion is happening through the grain. That's why it's a volume diffusivity. And then lowercase d is our grain size, right? And it makes sense that we would have the grain size in the equation because that sort of determines how far those atoms have to move. So one thing that's interesting to look at here is what is the effect of grain size? So what happens if the grain size is smaller? Right, so as the grain size gets smaller, which in general we think increases the strength of a material, but it turns out that as 
D gets smaller, the strain rate actually goes up. So when it comes to creep deformation, you actually don't want small grains. And that's one reason that, for example, turbine blades are made out of single crystal. They have no grain boundaries at all. Okay, so the next mechanism that we'll look at is another diffusional mechanism, and it's essentially kind of similar to the one that we've just looked at. Okay, so again we have here our grain and we have some applied stress and for the Nabarro herring creep we saw that the atoms and the dislocations moved through the grain but from grain boundary to grain boundary. Another possibility is actually that the vacancies just move along the grain boundaries. They use the grain boundaries as their highway, essentially. So the sample still elongates in essentially a similar way. It's just that the vacancies are moving in a different place. So let's look at the equation for strain rate in this case. Okay, so here's our equation. This subscript C is for COBOL creep. So COBOL and um, we have a constant here. We have stress where the exponent is still 1. We again have omega, the atomic volume, gas constant, and temperature. Like before, we have the grain size, although now there's even a stronger grain size dependence. Uh, this delta is the grain boundary thickness, right? Because you can imagine that if the grain boundary is somehow a little bit wider, then it's easier for those atoms or vacancies to diffuse. And then we have at the end here this DGB, so this is the grain boundary diffusivity. So sort of the rate of diffusion along the grain boundaries. So in the Nabarro herring we had the volume diffusivity, here we have the grain boundary diffusivity. So um, the question now is, which of these do we think will occur, Cobalt creep or Navarro herring, at a lower temperature? So we can essentially think about which one is easier to happen, and it's actually easier for the vacancies to move along the grain boundaries, even though it might seem like a longer path, because there's more space in there, right? A grain boundary is sort of this disordered region, and so it's easier for the atoms or vacancies to move there as compared to through the bulk. And so at lower temperatures, cobalt creep will occur, and that's because the diffusivity on the grain boundaries is higher than in the bulk. So let's finish this up just by sort of looking generally at where the different mechanisms occur taking this question that we just asked sort of one step further. So in the next video, we'll look at deformation mechanism maps. And right now, we'll just kind of get started on that as a summary of today's video. So on the y-axis here, we have the applied stress normalized by the shear modulus. We have the temperature here normalized by the melting temperature. So we saw that at low stresses and somewhat low temperature, diffusional creep by the grain boundaries is the dominant mechanism. So this is our cobalt creep and the vacancies or atoms are moving along the grain boundaries and we have the strain rate as shown here. At low stresses but high temperature, we have diffusional creep but the atoms or vacancies are moving through the bulk. And so that's our Nabarro herring creep, and we have the uh, volume diffusivity here as compared to the grain boundary diffusivity here. And the last one that we considered today was the power law creep, and that occurs at higher stress levels where the stress is enough in combination with the temperature for dislocations to move. And we have this uh, equation here. So in power law creep, the dislocations are moving and they are helped along by being able to climb over obstacles. So this is a summary of the different creep mechanisms that are possible.
the atomic level ways in which the macroscopic deformation occurs.